All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Philip Christian, who is over in Connecticut. How are you doing, Philip? Great, how are you? Uh, hi to the other coast. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and Philip is an international keynote speaker on the future of trust, hybrid work transformation, TEDx speaker, author of Reset and the Trust Economy. And what we're going to talk about today is human transformation. So, um, Christian, before we get straight into it, right, we hear a lot of talk and we talk about ourselves a lot here about digital transformation. Uh, and and the use of you know technology and and automation and efficiency and all of that, we don't tend to hear as much about a human transformation. So, so talk me through your what you mean by human transformation. Well, I thought that was quite metaphorical with the microphone. When we look at the past um, two years, right, technology is sort of actually supposed to help us, and yet for the longest time it's kind of gotten in the way and that's not really a human fault it's basically because we've built our technology ecosystems around well systems around bureaucracies mm -hmm. around a sort of monolithic view of organizations and as you and i both know as everyone knows intuitively they're not very human so i think what we are now faced with post or emerging from the pandemic is that we realize we lost the human touch in a lot of aspects and now i think the benefit of this uh, maybe hindsight and also this insight is that we can actually bring back what all of us value the most which is humanizing our interactions and most importantly those at work because those human interactions are sorely missed uh, they can be done online and they can be done virtually but we have to plan and design for those so what i mean by human transformation is to kind of shift the perspective inwards for a moment i think we all for certain um you know, logistical reasons got confronted with our own selves in a different way in the last 24 months. And I also believe that there is a, a nugget of wisdom to be gained from that. And this is basically that we look at the world a different way. We've, for example, looked at sales, at customer centricity, at digital transformation, sort of with an externalization perspective, you know, thinking that we just change the environment, we change things on the outside, and then things will just go. And yet time and time again, the reason things don't change is because for some reason people stay the same. So I, I would say that human transformation is an invitation towards introspection to realize that only when we as humans are changing, that's when organizations have a chance of transforming. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I would I would totally I, I would totally agree with that, and I think we have kind of lost sight a little bit of the of the human piece of it. And and I think and I think part of that is that we got so hung up on on the whole technological aspect kind of pre pandemic and then the pandemic came and, you know, we had to readjust all of that. And I think people are kind of caught in the middle of it now. I like that perspective. I mean, you as a martial artist would probably understand the, the value of inner game is that it's about basically, first of all, winning the battle within before mm -hmm. you even try and have a battle without. And maybe we should change the rhetoric here, change the metaphors, you know, instead of speaking about battling the virus or, you know, um, managing a transformation, let's talk about the future, right? Let's talk about the fact that most human beings aspire to be healthy and well and happy and live a peaceful life. So that kind of gives us a lot of common ground to work with. All we need to do is focus on that outcome and perhaps also trust ourselves more in getting there because this process and technocentric mindset, it takes away that human magic that is ultimately our capability to pathfind and to trailblaze, which is what we have as a species done since millennia. So I think it's about restoring faith and trust in our own abilities because that also predicates trust in the people around us. And as you and I would probably have noticed, as most people will notice, trust has been a sore topic in the past years, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I would agree completely. I think tr trust has been a sore topic. I think uh, it's... Um... And and it's something that people crave because they want to trust people. You know, I mean, yeah. we're all naturally skeptics, of course, but deep down we want to trust people. And whether it's in sales or whatever, we want to trust the other person. Um, yeah. But you definitely mentioned something interesting there. And I do think we had a technocentric approach. And but what we lost in that, in in what we've lost in in the technology is how can the technology actually uh, do 
you know, maybe automate or whatever, or do things to allow us to focus on the really human elements of, of business rather than just saying, let's just use technology to reduce as much as we can. It's like, how can we how can we use technology to take away or enhance the things that it can do? Meanwhile, freeing up more time for the human element to focus on the relationship part. Yeah, I think, look, I think we've talked about intelligent automation an awful lot in the past couple of months, years. Um, also, I think the perspective now is more one of intelligent augmentation, right? It's about how we can become more productive because productivity is really what's suffering from, you know, technocentricism, um, mm -hmm. how we can create a less uh, friction, uh, like less friction intense um, environment, how we can work better together and collaborate more. And that I think also means going beyond the transaction, you know, transactionalism, which I think is a big problem in sales and any discipline really, incentivizes competition, zero sum games. I like to think there's sort of three games we play. There is the dealing games, which are zero sum competing games. There is the stealing games where we try to sabotage others to get ahead in life. And there is the healing games, the games you should be playing, we should be playing. Those are the games where we create zero sum uh, and we turn, no, sorry, no, we create zero sum. We, we, we usually base them on a zero sum foundation and then we create a positive sum uh, mutual situation. And that requires purpose and it requires a focus on the shared uh, destination, right? It requires a sense of working together. You may have heard this, we're in this together rhetoric a lot during the pandemic. Well, as it turns out, that is our best shot at getting to the future because it's one planet and it's one people and we sort of have to come to terms with that in our behavior, right? That is, I think, what, what really the opportunity right now is using technology as a way to serve us rather than be being beholden to technology serving um, mostly itself and us serving whatever that end might be. Yeah, and I think another part of it too is that we, we live in what I always call a shortcut culture today. Um, <laughs> we're always looking, you know, everything is like easy, quick, this can do this, this can do that. And so we, to, to your point where you're talking about, we have to get away from this idea of using technology for shortcuts. Yeah, it's fine if it's a real shortcut and it can actually help, but just using it for shortcuts without looking at what is the long-term impact on the customer or whoever you're um, interacting with. <clears throat> so I think this goes to, brings us to data as well, brings us to, you know, ultimately, aligning interests like your customers interests and yours should be the same so the data you gather from them should provide value to them this has been a very sore point i think with a lot of companies misunderstanding this uh, dynamic and the other thing i guess when you talk about you know convenience culture or maybe that sort of you know shortcut approach um i'm, I'm a huge advocate for meditating and that may not be everyone's solution but for me it's a it's a stay uh, it's kind of like a, a stay in the moment it's really about recharging and finding time i'm sure that one day somebody would come up with an app that meditates for you right and that's i think pretty much the level we've reached is that if we try to outsource things to technology that we should probably take on ourselves and it would be for our own good right so i guess when we then apply this back to sales um if you think about it right it's it goes back to the inner game it's about the fact that human centricity in sales has nothing to do with putting the customer first it has everything to do with putting the human first and frankly that begins with you as presumably the salesperson mm -hmm. it begins with finding strength within rather than trying to in some way create subservience or listen to whatever people are externalizing as their needs it's to go deeper into the root and to connect at that level that may sound a little bit abstract to you, but then in the end, introspection is different for everyone, right? I do think this is just an invitation to to start that journey, really. Yeah, and no, I, I I agree. And one thing I've been talking recently with a lot of people about is I think when you just said there about the meditation or the introspection or taking some time out, I really do feel that people do not take enough time out today to be with themselves and really figure out because the mindset comes from your own sense of self as well. And we're so bombarded. We have all our devices all the time. We don't, it's almost like it's counterculture to take that time out to be with yourself. And the idea of to some people of being with themselves is even frightening. It's a, it's, it's almost sad a little bit, right? When we think about it, um, if you are kind of unhappy with, you know, being with yourself, then that's a problem because it means that you're in bad company when you're alone. Um, so, so that could be an issue. M more importantly, though, let's let, let's face it, right? Um, I think 
it would actually be helpful for us to have control, more control over our own existence and how we experience life. So if you, if you can fathom the fact that our nervous system, our entire experience of things biologically, chemically can change within a few seconds, and we are very much then you know, confronted with this idea of being in control um, or the possibility of being in control, it's a wonderful invitation, isn't it? To sort of have that ability, to train that ability to almost regain control, if one could say so. You know, to sort of take a breather from the constant, I would call it autopilot of hustle. You know, that sort of, I think a lot mm -hmm. of salespeople are going through this. I just talked to one a few uh, weeks ago who said, yeah, it's just constant and relentless. And just to take a step back from that and regain productivity inside and maybe a bit of wisdom, which was already inside, just waiting, lurking, waiting to get out. Yeah, and, and it's interesting there that, that what you just said about there, about this the salesperson, uh, you know, the hustle on autopilot. Um, I think the other thing that maybe going into 2022, um, unbelievable that we're nearly going into 2022. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And we say, uh, well, I'm not even going to say, well, let's hope 2022 is is a much brighter and better year because we said that at the beginning of 2021 yeah. and that, <laughs> that bit us. But but what I'm saying is is a sense of purpose. And I think that's something that people need yeah. to come back to again is why why do I do what I do? I, I think it's a it's a great starting conversation, right? And purpose has to be discovered rather than manufactured. I think we all know that intuitively about our own lives. When we take on a job we don't like, it rarely ends in happiness, right? So kind of like logical in that sense. Same for companies. Like the idea that purpose is optional is one of the biggest mistakes we can make because most people tend to be motivated more by things they truly believe in, right? Same with the pandemic. If people believe in taking the right actions, much better compliance is achieved. Why? Well, because you've got to take people as part of the solution rather than the problem. So if you and your organization want people to be on the bus, well, I guess purpose is a good starting point. And the other thing is maybe you also want to scratch their back. You want to do something for them, right? So there's always this expectation that you just put purpose in place and then people will just gladly follow. The reality is that you first have to demonstrate some level of giving, some level of care and interest in their own problems. And what I do know is that most organizations, most corporations experience the very same problems all around the world. So I just think it's time for leaders also, for us as leaders to, you know, to start solving those problems. Yeah, no, I, lo I love what you said there about that. Yeah, I think the most companies, the problems are pretty similar. And I've been um, some years back run a global consulting sales training consulting company. It's no, it doesn't matter the size of the company. We work with some of the biggest names in the world. Everybody thinks they've got exclusive, specific and individual issues and it turns out that there's a massive amount of commonality between them all. There is. And I think it's the contextualization that makes these issues unique in the same way that people think they have a unique proposition, whereas what they're referring to is actually context. There's nothing wrong with contextualizing your life, but you've got to be aware that there are some universal roots that are connecting it all. It's a little bit like, you know, when you have a, a row of mushrooms or a ring of mushrooms, you cut off one mushroom, another one grows back. And very rarely do people question what's actually underneath the soil, what's happening there, right? That's where you find the truffles. That's also where you have to change the nutrients in order to remove the ring of mushrooms. So quite metaphorical for businesses as, you know, they're trying to solve problems on the surface, the exterior, the external level. And at that level, we really are only ever talking symptoms. Yeah. So. And I, I think the and I think the other part of uh, about the the human element and human transformation, and we kind of touched on this briefly, but uh, the the what we talked about earlier about just people's working environments. I mean, the world has changed. Uh, I mean, some companies had changed bef before, you know, gone to a yeah. lot more virtual or hybrid. But now I think the future. Your organization could be some people in physical offices, some people who are in maybe come in physically, maybe one or two days a week. Some people who are, and then be virtual. Some people are completely virtual. Contractors who come in and out of virtual, maybe. So, the whole construct of your organization may be changing, and now the onus is on, is on leaders to figure out: okay, how do I harness the human potential here, knowing that I have all these different types of employees, and I don't end up just becoming biased towards one set. 
I think that's the nature of hybrid. It's that we finally are having a situation which we should have had 15 years ago because of technological possibilities. We now have it because of urgency. And I think there's a beautiful invitation for us also to reset our own thinking, to kind of like say, well, okay, maybe we should collaborate more. Maybe we should embrace this period as now a sort of urgency that can allow us to make meaningful change happen for good. I think we are doing that. And I would very much advocate to start with ourselves, right? Human transformation is an umbrella term. There's a lot of things that are covered by it. For me, what it truly means is actually going towards the root causes and resolving those. Because if you want to look at an organization as an organism, well, you may have to solve for these systemic health issues in order to get rid of those symptoms for good and also to make sure that you have vitality and longevity, right? And I think that for all of us, those topics are particularly relevant as we are still very much, you know, um, affected by the, the impact of COVID, um, both on a health perspective, on a healthcare system as well, but also on the systems that just exist around us, the systems that we all are living to for the longest time. So this is maybe just an invitation to rethink and reimagine those a little bit. And in that process, hopefully find a new angle to ourselves. Yeah, and I, I would I would agree with you. I think it's a it's an unbelievable opportunity. It's an it's an opportunity to to completely rethink your organization because one of the things and I think personally I think this started certainly in the US around the financial crisis time. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people uh, started to question the wisdom of buying a house or, or renting an apartment in a high cost area just to be close to work or not even be close oh. to work and then oh, yeah. commute, commuting an <laughs> hour and a half each way and all of this and then only to get laid off because yeah. there was a downturn. And I think people started to question, like, why am I locating myself somewhere where there's no upside for me if I lose my job? I'm, I'm pretty screwed, right? You know, I mean, so maybe it's better for me to go find somewhere that suits me, suits my standard of living, suits what I want from, from an yeah. environment, and then find a job, you know, remotely. I it's quite funny because I think it does call to question urbanization overall. You know, a lot of people are lonely in cities. And so the fundamental irony that we live in this massive amount of, you know, just this huge pool of people and we feel lonely. That's just very strange, isn't it? And you realize that it's actually the distrust culture of cities built on traditional industrialist principles, right? The idea of command and control, the kind of guilty until proven innocent KPIs, you know, competition, all of those things make people feel like they're living in a hostile environment in which we react naturally as humans with stress. So I think it's an invitation for us to rethink our living spaces quite literally and also metaphorically to rethink the way in which we live, work and play, right? Kind of proverbially yeah. like that. And and obviously, I mean, I think it means, it, obviously depending on the type of business that you're running, but your access to talent, if you're more flexible in yeah. your in the way you set up your organization, is obviously exponential. Uh, if you, or, uh, as opposed to if you say, okay, you either got to move here or we got to find somebody who's within a thirty yeah. mile radius. I'd like to maybe kind of then take this perspective of talent and fan it out a little bit, right? Sure. We always talk about talent and skills. The reality, though, is that a toxic culture will wither any and all talent, and a lot of talent can be developed far beyond where it currently is at. So I think. It's also about us to understand that human transformation would be a way of looking at talent dynamically, that it's about inviting and creating a culture in which people can transform themselves and actually do so in a beneficial way. And as a result of that, you know, us as an organization, we would be thriving and transforming in response as well. And I think this begins as anything with the senior executives, which is kind of where I'm seeing the biggest impact of this work as well, when you change a few of the fundamentals that people have just taken as as a face value or taken as fact, um, the entire organization begins transforming because people aren't even aware that they're changing. But it's just that their outlook on the world, because of the outlook on themselves, um, both have completely uh, transformed. And this is an ongoing process that you might term healing or you could just term, you know, a sort of introspection that leads to a lot greater perspective when you then look on the outside. Yeah, and, and, and I think the other part of that, obviously, as you know, is that when you have the senior leadership modeling a particular behavior, then the rest of people, the rest of the organization is likely to Absolutely. find to follow it, as opposed to the world we live in today, where people think that if you shout at people and call them stupid, you can somehow change yeah. their mind. Instead of sort of, <laughs> sort of trying just, to find who to blame, right? Just yeah. going to a direction where you lead by example, well, because 
people are going to pick up the cue. If you can transform yourself as a senior executive, your team will have the confidence and trust to do it as well. And so if you ever want to even build an environment of trust, you, you've got to trust yourself first before you try trusting other people. You've got to achieve that balance of you know, introspection and then also looking ahead. And when you have that, you figure out that a lot of things that beforehand were very complex and whack suddenly become a lot easier. And I think that level of flow, that, that level of autopilot, that's, the, that's a desirable one and that's something to attain. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. A great place to to end. I was just smiling because, yeah, it, it's funny when you actually focus in on things and really pay attention to them. It, they often turn out to be a lot simpler than they seem. Because I don't know, there's something there's something about human beings about how we just love to complicate things. I think that our nature is actually to solve and thrive amidst complexity. And as long as we trust our ability, our implicit ability to do that. I think on a cognitive level, we can let go a little bit, right? At that cognitive level, we may like to complicate, but intuitively and also emotively, most people prefer simplicity. And fair enough, because it does mean that we trust ourselves more and we get more done, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. I just think it's sometimes we work it, we work against ourselves because you see people like you're trying to get a, a, a simple um, straightforward outcome but, but yeah. we design things to exceptions instead of to the rule and then deal with the exceptions after and so that's exactly where i think we can leverage technology to sort of help us build a more algorithmic world which by the way mimics our mind so technology should always have been human now i think is our time to really rehumanize it and use it for that purpose yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. And just to let everybody know that all of um, <clears throat> all of Philip's information will be below this video so you can find out more. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. Um, I mean, as you said, I do do a lot of speaking these days. I also uh, teach executive education, mostly leadership transformation. Surprise, surprise. And uh, I'm involved and I have been for over a decade in APAC and various uh, startups. Some of them were three people and there are now a few hundred. Um, a lot of them have had the chance to transform their industries for good. You know, as I like to say, innovation is a choice, disruption kind of isn't. So it's about which side of the coin you're on. And as a result of that, I do a lot of uh, advisory, a lot of it retained with uh, C-suites on various future related issues. Of course, how do we humanize and build a purpose driven organization? And most people realize that that's also their key to actually being more commercially successful to keeping the shareholders and the board happy and also managing, you know, that massive transformation agenda, whether it's intergenerationality, whether it is purpose, whether it is ESG and sustainability, all those wonderful things. And because there are such big things, I think we really need guideposts and we need to put things into what I would call the center of gravity. So I like working on that and I like, you know, the organization to discover that center of gravity and figure out that all of these complicated seeming things aren't actually that difficult. They can be put into something simple and compelling and in fact driving. And that's what makes me happiest when I can work on that with clients. So that's my favorite thing. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so I would encourage you to go check check it out. And uh, yeah, gra gra finding the center of gravity is always a good thing. Gravity is a good thing, let's face it. Gravity is a day. good thing, especially <laughs> when it's serving the right purposes and when the core is correct. So no, this has been wonderful. Um, I love this kind of just open conversation. And I also think we've given quite a buffet of, you know, perspectives. So very fun yeah. to do this. All right, great. Well, thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. Likewise.